Thank you. Thank you to Sages and the moderators for the opportunity to speak. Oh. I have no disclosures. So first, um, we need to, this is a brief talk, but we need to spend a little bit of time defining what we're talking about. So this is the Chicago classification version 3.0 which is our current classification scheme for motility disorders. Um, I think it's, it's sort of already been covered what the variants of achalasia are, but I'll talk about that a little bit. And then EGJ outflow obstruction is something that I'll try to spend a little bit more time on. And then we have spastic disorders, distal esophageal spasm and jackhammer esophagus. And then um, I'm not gonna cover aperistalsis today. So first, um, I advanced a little bit, but each day outflow obstruction. So all of the disorders that are gonna be shown on this slide um, involve EGJ outflow obstruction. And the first disorder is just EGJ outflow obstruction. So as Ezra mentioned, um, you see a non-relaxing LES, but with preserved peristalsis. So on the bottom, you're gonna see the high resolution manometry in images. And then above that, you can see a representative esophagram and um, and then what the innervation of the esophagus looks like in that cartoon. So next we have type two achalasia, which was mentioned as the most common type. This, in this um, type of achalasia, you see panesophageal pressurization and a relatively normal size of the esophagus. In type one achalasia, you have uh, some dilation of the esophagus and no peristalsis. And in type three achalasia, this is our spastic type of achalasia. It is the most rare and the most difficult to treat. So actually, no matter what treatment modality you look at, um, although it, I think it can be argued that this may change somewhat with POEM, type three responds uh, the least. So now hypermotility disorders, as I mentioned, distal esophageal spasm. So this is defined by spastic contractions, which basically means premature contractions. And then we used to have nutcracker esophagus. Now we have jackhammer esophagus, which is defined by very high amplitude contractions. So to talk a little bit more about EGJ outflow obstruction, um, I think what I want to stress here is that this is not always clinically significant. <laughs> so some people, you know, we've sort of lumped it in the Chicago classification and in this talk um, with achalasia, and in some patients this will progress to achalasia, but in the majority of patients this actually has a benign course. So if you see someone with a manometry finding of EGJ outflow obstruction, this is a manometric diagnosis where clinical correlation is really important because this is a heterogeneous group of patients and you don't necessarily know yet what the clinical course is going to be for that patient. So some patients may be symptomatic with this. Um, if they have associated weak peristalsis, they can have poor bolus clearance. Um, however, patients with a relatively normal DCI or peristalsis uh, may have unimpaired swallowing. Um, it's a great idea to consider uh, an esophagram maybe with a tablet to look at correlation on that study uh, to figure out if this manometric finding is actually affecting their swallowing. Consider medications that could be affecting uh, pressures at the LES. So opiates and anticholinergics are some common examples of those. And then, you know, we're surgeons, we need to remember to evaluate for pseudoachalasia or extrinsic compression. So you can commonly see this finding on a manometry when you're evaluating a, a patient who has paraesophageal hernia. Um, don't be alarmed by that, that's probably the hernia. Um, it has been argued, uh, actually, I think at Northwestern, there was a study looking at EUS in these patients. So, you know, the rate of findings is relatively low, but if you're concerned, you can ask for an EUS to look for um, some sort of intramural lesion that may be related to this. Occasionally that's found. Um, but just remember that most of these patients will actually have a benign course. So an overview of treatment of motility disorders. Um, I think it's important for us, especially as surgeons, to remember that there aren't actually curative therapies for this dis these disorders. So when we talk about treating these patients, we're actually talking about palliation and relief of symptoms. Um, and the goal, as Ezra mentioned, is really to allow for adequate esophageal emptying. That's what we're able to do. So these are the options which have really, um, I think, all been covered already. <laughs> so I'll just highlight how they can be applied to these disorders more specifically. So for hypermotility disorders, some of the medications that may be useful are antacids, um, because some of these can be related to GERD. Uh, also, smooth muscle relaxants have been employed with 
you know, probably not great efficacy. Um, antidepressants, interestingly, have some, shown some efficacy in jackhammer esophagus. So that's something to remember. So now let's go on to more interventional therapies. In terms of treating spastic motility disorders, um, this is a study from the 1990s by Marco Patti looking at surgical myotomy. This, these were thoracoscopic myotomies, which were also long myotomies. Um, this is not a randomized study, but they did compare two groups of patients who were treated medically or surgically and found that the long myotomy was more effective um, by symptom scores for the disorders of DES and nutcracker. So let's talk a little bit more about POEM and the data that are emerging around this procedure. Um, this has been uh, promoted as a good procedure potentially for type 3 achalasia as has been mentioned, as well as potentially other spastic disorders of the esophagus such as DES and jackhammer. Um, there has actually been a meta-analysis uh, in, in 2017, which covered the eight observational studies that were available for a total of 179 patients. Now, importantly, I, I want to highlight that the endpoint in this meta-analysis was resolution or improvement of dysphagia. This means that um, they were not able in the meta-analysis to look at other important symptoms, such as chest pain, for example, because not all of the studies reported that outcome. However, for the symptom of dysphagia, the success rates were fairly high for these disorders. Um, you can see this is, the success rate is highest for achalasia and then lowest for jackhammer. So this is just going into some of the primary observational data that actually went into that meta-analysis. But the reason why uh, POEM is promoted for these disorders is because of the myotomy length, which can be quite long on average. Um, in some of the observational trials individually, they did report outcomes for chest pain and also objective data such as repeat manometry and showed that those were improved also. Again, dysphagia relief better for achalasia than the other diagnoses and the lowest response rate for jackhammer. Okay, so now I'm gonna um, just completely switch gears and talk about anti-reflux surgery. So now this, this may seem counterintuitive because this is basically the opposite of everything we've been talking about in the session so far. But in a retrospective study from the University of Washington, um, they looked at 221 patients who had diagnoses of what you might consider spastic disorders of the esophagus. So this is not Chicago classification, but they were, well, some of it is, but nutcracker or jackhammer, DES, and hypertensive LES, which I think of as being kind of the old EGJ outflow obstruction. So they found that um, in this group of patients with these disorders identified on manometry, half of them actually also had an abnormal pH study. Of, of that group, 66 of them went on to have fundoplications, um, which were actually Nissen's. And all of the patients who had follow-up, which was a smaller subset, had symptom improvement after the Nissen's. Five out of the six who actually had a repeat manometry actually had normalization of their motility from these initial spastic disorders. So this is kind of crazy. I've been talking about myotomy and POEM, and now I'm talking about Nissen. What's the point here? Well, I think the point is, Whenever we're treating patients with foregut pathology, we have to do a complete workup, and we have to do our best to correlate the patient's presenting symptoms with the results of our studies. And so when you go back and look at what the patient's presenting symptoms were in this cohort, the patients who were presenting with typical reflux symptoms, the majority of them had an abnormal pH study. Um, those who are presenting with dysphagia or chest pain as their primary symptoms, most of them had a normal pH study. So fortunately, they actually correlated. You won't always be presented with patients where your studies and your symptoms correlate, but when, when you can do that, it makes you feel more comfortable about developing a treatment plan. So in conclusion, um, our evaluation of esophageal motility has come a long way with high-resolution manometry and perhaps in some instances beyond our ability to clinically correlate. Uh, I think of EGJ outflow obstruction like that sometimes. Spastic motility disorders have always been challenging to treat, and in particular, the symptom of chest pain is quite challenging. Um, but there may be a role for surgery in these disorders. I, I think that treatment decisions should involve a multidisciplinary team or at least a multimodal evaluation, and a re reliable manometry interpretation is really a must. Um, and ideally, you will be able to correlate the symptoms of your patient with their study results to determine the best course of treatment for them. Thank you. <laughs>